right. I feel that was like the perfect setup for our next speaker because, you know, there's so many brilliant ideas in this room. I guarantee you that I'm going to say at least 50 people have thought of what company they want to found next within the last two hours in this room. Just so much talent. Uh, but how do you actually take a good idea and make it real? Well, I'm about to introduce you to someone who has done that very, very well. They've got a booth here. You can actually interact with making it real. Please welcome to the stage the CEO of Checkerspot, Charles Dimmler. Good morning. So here we are, day three, at Built With Biology. And it's a race against the clock. At this moment in time, it feels like the world has changed. In the past, when we thought about Built With Biology, it didn't really seem like we had the support, the advocacy, from those in the world that are looking to move past things like petroleum and commodity vegetable oils. But today, that's changed. So the why is a concept that now more people understand and appreciate, but it's the how that still remains to be answered. And perhaps it's the question behind the how. How do we make it real? How do we make it accessible? How do we make it something that is tangible. In my presentation this morning, I'm going to share the benefit of some lessons learned over the course of the last decade plus, even preceding founding and starting Checkerspot. And because I know this is a conference that's rich in science there, are, and there's a lot of math folks in the audience, I'm going to share seven lessons. And, and the only reason why it's seven, there's plenty more lessons that I could share, but seven because it's a lucky number and I happen to be superstitious and I'm going to try to move through these seven lessons really quickly. But first, a little bit of background on Checkerspot. Checkerspot's a materials company and we're powered, we're enabled by biomanufacturing, by biology, and specifically we're working with microalgae that we engineer to produce certain types of oils, triglycerides, new kinds of monomers that have interesting chemistry that allows us to formulate performance materials that differentiate ultimately consumer products and industrial applications. So lesson one, make it real. That's the thesis of the talk. That's the key message, the key takeaway that I hope everybody walks away from this presentation appreciating. Make it real. But what does that mean? So when I think back to when we started Checkerspot back in 2016, it was our own version of race against the clock. We raced to leverage what we had, what we had in hand, an initial set of monomers and worked feverishly to put those to use, to develop applications, use cases, like, for instance, skate wheels or surfboards that could start to animate what was possible. And this was really important to us because we wanted to develop the conviction that we could demonstrate physical properties that we knew there was a high probability we would be able to do that, but we hadn't yet demonstrated it. It was theoretical more than actual. So it was a race to start to bring those applications to life. We wanted to make it real. And we had a level of success in doing that, a level of success in categories like urethanes and textile finishes, uh, lubricants even. But not everything that we tried worked out. Not everything that we developed really saw the light of day, ultimately. And that brings me to the second lesson, which is to choose wisely. And the universe has a tendency to provide signals that some things maybe aren't the right path to go down. And bike chain lubricant, I can tell you, is one that is not a good path to go down. And I'm going to explain why. Now, we thought that it was an interesting place to start because we had an oil from microalgae that had first-in-class properties like oxidative stability and lubricity 
and a poor point that was really interesting. We even had a, a partner that involved one of the world's renowned triglyceride chemists that was helping with formulation work. And we had applications, we had examples of this bike chain lubricant, and we spent a lot of time just going to bike shops and to sharing the product with bike shop owners and users. We even did a trial at Google's campus. For those of you who visited Google's campus in Mountain View, they have a huge fleet of thousands of bicycles. We thought, what a great opportunity to trial this bio-based lubricant with these interesting properties in this bike fleet. And, and it worked, and there was support. But the reality is that bicycle chain lubricant just isn't something that's emotive. It isn't something that really grabs people's attention, that occupies mind share the way some other products and categories do. And so when we thought about the prospect of continuing to invest and develop this, we actually decided to back away from it. We didn't think that it was sufficiently emotive. We didn't think that it was something that really occupied Mindshare. When you think about the top 10 things that people are contemplating when it comes to cycling or riding bikes, we learned bicycle chain lubricant just isn't one of those things. And so if you want to have impact and if you want to make something real, we decided that this wasn't the path to go down. And that brings me to lesson three. Innovate what you love. Now the universe also conspired to kind of push, coax us in a different direction. Just prior, out of curiosity, I decided to go and do a ski building workshop in Innsbruck, Austria. Now, I had no business building skis. The last time I did anything involved building and working with wood was back when I was in ninth grade in high school. And Nothing remarkable to talk about in that experience. But being in Innsbruck and doing the ski building workshop, just as an enthusiast, ended up being illuminating. And illuminating in a couple of different ways, one of which being that it's a category where the performance of materials really matter. It's a category that is emotive. It's a category where all of the brands that are competing for Mindshare talk about different materials that they're trying to utilize. But the reality is that everybody is baking cake with the exact same ingredients, using the exact same feedstocks, even manufactured in the same exact factories in different parts of the world. There isn't a lot of differentiation. And so, as an avid backcountry skier, I knew two things for sure. The first is that the mountains are an unforgiving environment an environment where performance matters, where you can't trade performance for sustainability. And second, I knew that there was a demographic of consumer, the hardcore enthusiasts, that take the time to really understand what goes into their products, that are thinking on that level, and that will gravitate to products that actually perform better. So, I knew that there was an opportunity, and in 2019, we ultimately ended up launching Wonder Alpine, our consumer brand. And the experience in Innsbruck revealed that in order to do that, we really needed to partner with people that understood the manufacturing process, that understood how we would penetrate the market. And fortunately, again, the universe would step in, and I was randomly introduced to Matt Sturbins, who's photographed on the left here. Matt was a former professional skier and developed an amazing reputation within the ski industry for his own entrepreneurial pursuits, building and commercializing skis. And so we partnered up and we started embarking on applications development testing, trial and error, looking to see how we could replicate what we were observing at the bench scale, at the lab scale, out in the field. And we also worked closely with a cadre of professional athletes and mountain professionals that are out in that environment consistently, that really have that discerning eye. And lo and behold, we stumbled upon something that was really valuable, specifically lightweighting, 
so strength to weight, damping, or energy absorbing properties. And then we also stumbled upon a physical property of adhesive strength for a cast urethane that really has value in holding an edge in mixed conditions. So innovate what you love. There's an added benefit of developing this product. And that added benefit is it's become a metaphor for our business and a metaphor for this presentation. Get out over your skis. Fear is inextricably linked, tied up, part of life. There's a tendency sometimes to avoid situations that feel uncomfortable, that provoke feelings of fear, that are, provoke discomfort. Yet, life is really defined by those moments where we extend outside of ourselves, beyond ourselves. There's something that is magical about that. And when you've ever seen someone descending an aggressive line skiing, you can appreciate you can appreciate that there's balance between getting too far out over your skis and sitting back on your skis. There's a tendency to think that if you sit back on your skis and avoid that uncertainty, that you're gonna be safer, but it actually paradoxically introduces a different kind of risk. And so when we think in the context of this metaphor about the risks that exist within biomanufacturing, it's things that we hear frequently, like you're not gonna be able to scale, the technology is unproven, you don't have the supply chain locked up, consumers aren't gonna care about materials that are sustainable, the markets that you're pursuing, they're too niche, they're too small, or the markets that you're pursuing, too big, too ambitious, the capital requirements are too significant. These are the hazards, these are the risks that we hear. But coming back to this metaphor, if you're skiing down a steep slope and there's a rock in the middle of the slope, if you fix your eyes on that rock, well guess what? You're probably gonna hit the rock. But instead, if you note the rock, if you're aware of the rock, but you pick up your line of sight and you look beyond the rock, the chances that you navigate and don't hit the rock go way up. And so when we think about the hazards that exist within the biomanufacturing space, and you make something real, all of a sudden you've negotiated past that rock, and those hazards, they don't matter anymore. The only thing that matters, it's what's coming around the next bend. What are the next set of hazards, the next set of challenges? Lesson five, create awareness for biology inside. For those of you who are music lovers, you may recognize the gentleman on the left-hand side of this photograph. It's Biggs Burke, one of the co-founders of Rockefeller Records, uh, alongside Jay-Z and Dame Dash. And this is a photograph of Biggs in the Checker Spot Laboratory, and on the right-hand side is a non-vinyl record that was created from oil from microalgae. Now, again, coming back to the metaphor, you can view the world and see a lot of obstacles. Or you can view those obstacles as opportunities, things that you have to get past. Think about line of sight and where your eyes go, your body is gonna follow. You can see those opportunities. But also being aware of your capability set. And one thing I can assure you, we don't understand the music industry the way Biggs and friends do. So for us, there's a concept of tapping into network effects, educating and creating awareness about how these technologies, how these materials have broad utilization. So let's think about petroleum for just a second. Petroleum is found everywhere in so many different product embodiments. And we know from what we're doing at Checker Spot and our view of a post-petroleum world and how we now have an alternative source of oil that transcends things like petroleum, the use cases are vast. We can't be the ones to do all of that ourselves. We have to work with others. 
that have the skills, the expertise, the influence, the relationships to bring these concepts to life, to make it real. It's a race against the clock. Everybody understands that we have until about mid-century to address this climate change issue, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Consumers, consumer brands, and by extension, those along the value chain now understand that this is a serious issue. It's now become priorities, goals, that individuals and teams within large companies are being measured against. But not everybody has the experience base, the education, the background to understand what it means to engineer the lipid pathway in heterotrophic microalgae that we then ferment and feed fermentable sugar to get to an oil that's then processed into a polyol to get to a polyurethane, so on and so forth. But that's okay, they don't need to know that. But by the same time, and they don't need to know that because we know how to do that, but at the same time, we need to understand what their needs are. We need to understand how to make it relevant, how to make it accessible, how to connect on an emotional, on a human level, in order to tap into those network effects and move the field forward. So how do we do that? How do we penetrate these supply chains? How do we tap into those network effects? Well, one thing we can do is take inspiration from history. The keys to our future lie in our past. Past can be prologue. Now, what I'm about to describe or say might be a little bit controversial. And it might be controversial because when I look at the petrochemical industry and I study the history of the petrochemical industry, I think we often today make the mistake of casting dispersions. I think we should celebrate the petrochemical industry. I think that it's a marvel of achievement how a barrel of crude oil, nearly every single element of a barrel of crude oil finds its way to a market. It's a marvel of capitalism and efficiency to be able to develop supply chains and to capture value and to manage cost structure in a highly complex environment. And Again, just eyeballing around the room, look at how many embodiments, even those of us who see a post-petroleum future, still use petroleum. We shouldn't cast dispersions. What we should be doing is focusing on how we can leverage technology, and biology specifically, as a new expanded tool set, but it's up to us to de-risk that. And I have the conviction that as we do, the petrochemical industry is gonna adopt these technologies as an alternative, but that responsibility lies to us. Lesson seven, look for answers in nature and let's rewild. I think the answers are right in front of us and not just in the context of biology and peering down a microscope, but also in the context of reconnecting with nature generally. Think for a moment that there's nothing in nature that goes to waste. This concept of linear consumption and extracting resources that are finite, that's a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. But concepts of circularity are becoming increasingly prominent and real. At Checkerspot, we think about rewilding in three ways. The first is pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that plants metabolize to create chemical energy, the sugar, and then feeding that to fermentation, where microalgae metabolize that to produce novel oils at high yield, at high productivity. It's a circular system. The second, though, is thinking about how we can utilize the flashings from manufacturing, or to think about the product at the end of life, and how we can recycle, repurpose, reuse, find value for those materials. And we're coming to market with some of those product embodiments. It's a lot easier for us to think about building with intention 
It's a lot easier for us to build up and to demonstrate making it real than it is to tear down and rebuild an existing infrastructure and system. The third concept is it seems to us that mankind, humanity is at its best when it is connected with nature, coming back to the metaphor. And I think the pandemic in particular has really amplified this. First of all, it's amplified that it turns out we're not at the top of the food chain like we thought we were, that we share the planet with other organisms, and that we're a lot more connected than perhaps we imagined. And in addition to that, the pandemic has amplified that there are these existential threats, that there are things to focus on. And in quarantine, we saw more people getting outside, more people connecting with rivers and lakes and oceans and open spaces and mountains, all of the wildland as a way to help manage and get through some of the challenges and difficulties associated with the pandemic. So it is a race against the clock. And what we've seen is by making it real, by effectively de-risking the product embodiments of materials that come from biomanufacturing, this serves to accelerate the adoption. And I'm gonna wrap up and close with one example of that, which goes back to the history of Checkerspot back in 2017, about a year after we were founded. We were introduced to a ski brand, DPS Skis. DPS Skis is the largest manufacturer of skis in the US. And they were really interested to, to hear what we were up to, what we were doing. But when we started talking about biology, we lost them. You could see that they just didn't get it. Why would they? They'd never seen or heard this kind of technology deployed before. And so the relationship never progressed. It never moved forward. But when we had launched Wonder Alpine in 2019, six months later, they came back. How can we get access to these materials? And we started working with them. And just recently, earlier this year, DPS announced adopting checker spot materials inside. And not only did they make that announcement, <laughs> not only did they make that announcement, but they're branding checker spot materials inside, creating that awareness of biology inside. And this is further catalyzing others interested in evaluating and accessing not only the Checkerspot platform, but the materials that we're creating. We're running out of time, actually and figuratively. <laughs> we're running out of time. We need urgency. It is a race against the clock. And I encourage you to think that biology has a lot of the answers. However, in order for us to, for that to manifest, in order for that to be a reality, we have to make it real. We have to develop those use cases, make it accessible. We have to think about how to communicate and connect with consumers in a way that is relatable. And so I ask you to join me in the figurative backcountry of our minds, to take that risk, to have that courage, to not be dissuaded by fear, to target your line of sight beyond the rock in the, in the trail to think about getting past it, through it, as we bring this to life and make things real, built with biology. Thank you. <laughs>